What organizations tend to struggle with is that agile nature. I set a strategy and this is my strategy and I'm going to execute that strategy. Well, after year one, if that strategy is not working or no longer relevant, you have to change it. And too often people are like, no, I'm going to stay the course and I'm going to keep driving down this road and that's my strategy. And that just doesn't work. You can't change just for the sake of changing. You've got to change with intention and, and have a reason to change and know the reason to change with data points that help influence and direct that change. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Global Achievers. In today's episode, we have Chris Hood. He's the head of business innovation and strategy at Google. And we have a very fascinating conversation ahead of us. And perhaps he's even gonna give us the secrets on how we can rank on top of Google search. You never know. So stick around, we'll be right back. Hello, Chris. Welcome to the S Factor. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. How about you? I'm doing very well myself. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm very excited about our conversation today. So uh, let's start off with what's on everyone's mind. What's the secret to Google's algorithm? I need to get on top of uh, page one. How do I do it? <laughs> well, first you take a jar of peanut butter. Okay. And then some bread. I you got might that. choose to get some jelly. Mm -hmm. Bread, some peanut butter on one side, some jelly on another piece of bread. Put them together. You've got the ultimate peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Mm. I think that's a good start. Uh, I think that is definitely a good start. We can uh, roll with that and see what the rest of the interview uh, unravels. I'm, I'm more excited now than I was uh, before I got started. So, um, awesome. Let's start off by sharing a little bit of the things that you do on a daily basis at Google. Well, I spend most of my time at Google talking with our customers or potential customers who are looking to grow their business and really understand how they can leverage different types of technologies to help them grow their business. And most of the time I'm working with large organizations you know, the big giant companies of the world that we're all familiar with the brands and uh, products of. I don't spend so much time with small businesses or startup businesses, but I have from time to time had those conversations. But again, all of it revolves around the simple thought of, I have a business, I want to grow that business, I wanna reach my customers in new ways, and how do I go about doing that? Okay, okay, excellent. So um, it's been a uh, really illustrious 30 year plus career for yourself. You've been in diverse industries, you've held uh, various leadership roles. So I'm just wondering if we could just map certain elements of the things that you have done in your previous roles. What are some of the biggest elements you would say that you have sort of stayed with you throughout your career and you're even using them today? Yeah, I think the basics seem like maybe no brainers, but it's important to call them out. And that's communication, your ability to communicate with people, whether that's in a written form or like we're doing audio form, podcasting, uh, public speaking, standing up in front of people to talk. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who are listening right now who are thinking like, uh, no, I can't talk in front of people. Public speaking is not for me. But foundationally, your ability to walk up to somebody, ask them a question, talk to them, and learn from them is critical. That communication is going to be with you no matter what you do. And it's foundation for growing your business. You have to be able to communicate with your customers. You have to be able to listen to your customers in terms of what they want and, and what they need from you. And so that is just one of these foundational things and skills that everybody needs to learn. 
and improve upon and consistently use. Communication is one. The other one is trying something new. Now, I've mostly been in the media and entertainment space, but throughout my career, I've never hesitated to try something new. And again, this sounds rather, you know, foundational, but your ability to kind of learn and adapt and try and even fail can be a way to grow personally, as well as to understand and contribute to where you go next. So I'll give you an example. Today, when I have conversations with customers, I still reference something that I did 30 years ago. One, because it's relevant, but two, those experiences and those personal views and opinions on things are ways that we can contribute to a conversation. And so I would highly encourage people to just go out and try something. And even in your career, you may love your job. You may not like your job. If you don't like your job, go try something different. Like literally quit, <laughs> go find another job and just try it because you may find something that you love. And if nothing else, you get the experience out of that that can help you in your next career goal. Okay, excellent. So I want to pick up on something you just mentioned was about trying something new. Uh, we know change is constant and um, there are a lot of elements of disruptive, whether it's technology, ideas, or processes which are in play in today's world. So speaking of change, majority of the discussion that I keep hearing is about mindset. It's about having the right mindset in order to affect change, in order to deal with change. But I wanted to explore with you, like, what is beyond mindset? Well, there are three elements, I think. And it's a good question. And it's a good way to look at this. I think we talk about mindset often because that is the first step, no matter what. You have to have the right mindset to do and to make the change. Just like we talked about in terms of trying something new and, and quitting your job and going and trying a different job, that's going to take a mindset. There's a lot of people who are sitting here like, no, I can't quit my job. I hate it. I, I despise waking up every morning and going to it. Well, that's on you, right? You, you've got to adjust your mindset to say like, okay, yeah, I realize I have bills and I realize I have responsibilities and I realize I have all of this, but I'm miserable and I don't want to be miserable anymore. How do I be happy? That's all mindset, right? After that is probably data. Like you have to start doing the research. So you say, okay, I'm comfortable with leaving my job and I'm comfortable with trying to find a new job what job is that? So you'll start researching. You'll start asking questions. You'll start asking opinions. You'll talk to your parents or your friends or family and say, you know, what do you think I should do? How should I go about it? Where should I look? What, what types of jobs am I interested in? You're collecting data. You're doing that research and you're, you're getting the information to help you make a better decision about what to change. And this is the same thing in organizations. If an organization wants to change, they first have to have the mindset to change, and then they have to collect the data to understand what to change. Because you just can't go out and say, oh, let's change that over there and change that over there. Why? You can't change just for the sake of changing. You've got to change with intention and, and have a reason to change and know the reason to change with data points that help influence and direct that change. So first mindset, second is data and, and gathering information, research, understanding. And then the third one is actually doing it, <laughs> right? Again, seems obvious, but it's okay. I've collected all this data and it's showing me that, you know, I should change that. I should change that. Uh, that all makes sense. Now do it like, <laughs> I know so many people who have changed their mindset, like, yeah, I'm going to go get a new job. 
And yeah, I'm going to go apply to this job, uh, but I'm not really ready to go do it yet. Well, you, if you want the change to happen and it's not going to come just by sitting around, right? So, so you have to actually execute on what you've learned, the data that is influencing you and take advantage of that shift in mindset that you've uncovered uh, during the process. So mindset, data, do it, I think would be your three top steps. Right, right. And this also, um, you've mentioned a very interesting point about individuals as well as organizations. Now, for organizations, it more or less falls within the greater strategy that they have about running their business. So this brings up a very interesting topic is that majority of small business owners and even, you know, mid-sized businesses and such, they struggle with forming a correct strategy for their business, or they're not agile enough to change when they see something is not working. So again, the discussion will be a little general in nature, but I, I really want to know from you in terms of forming business strategy, what are, I don't know if there are general steps that a business can take in terms of forming business strategy. Well, forming a strategy is really almost the exact same steps that we just outlined for change. Mm -hmm. Because what is, what is a strategy? A strategy is a roadmap for your organization to be successful. And that roadmap typically evolves change. Think about a road trip that you might go on. If, if you're going on a vacation and you uh, print out a map, that map is going to have uh, turns and freeways and stops and I have to get gas. And uh, sometimes you have to adjust on your road trip in real time. Like, oh, I'm running out of gas sooner than I want. Or, hey, there's the world's largest rubber band ball. Let's go check that out. Uh, oh, this looks like a cool gas station. You know, so you're evolving as you're on that journey and your roadmap or your strategy is just, we're going to make a left-hand turn here and a right-hand turn here. We've got a starting point and a destination. What happens in between, that's roughly your strategy. But again, along the way, you've got data and you're learning from that data and you're evolving your strategy based on what you've learned. And then you ultimately have to execute on it. What organizations tend to struggle with is that agile nature. I set a strategy and this is my strategy and I'm going to execute that strategy. Well, after year one, if that strategy is not working or no longer relevant, you have to change it. And too often people are like, no, I'm going to stay the course and I'm going to keep driving down this road and that's my strategy. And that just doesn't work. The foundation of every good business strategy starts with your customer, no matter what it is. So you have to understand what your customers' needs and expectations and wants are. Why are they coming to you? And then target those. And here's the essential piece to that. Your customers' needs and expectations are going to change. They're not going to stay the same. And as they change, you have to change not only your business and your strategy and your technology and everything else that goes with it, you have to change to continually meet the needs and expectations of your customers who are changing. And that's often the piece that people forget about. And so again, some of this is a mindset shift. You've got to adjust your mind to know that a strategy evolves yearly, if right. not quicker, right. and then use the data to understand it and then actually execute on it. Right. Got it. Uh, very nicely said. So um, I want to pivot a little bit um, and just talk about company culture. Um, there is a lot of discussion out there about it. Um, and majority of the discussion seems to revolve around a top-down approach. 
it's the leaders of the organization or the owners of a particular business who set the company culture. Uh, what is your opinion about that? Well, it will always start from the top down. So that's true. The challenge in company culture is that when it starts from the top down is still executing on that, adhering to it, maintaining it. And the maintaining of that culture has to happen more or less from the bottom up. Most of the politics, we'll say, corporate politics, company politics, gossip at the water cooler, uh, you know, VAB vibes in the workplace are all at the bottom level and they simmer up. And that's saying that from the top down, that culture is not being fully executed or that the bottom up is not maintaining it in the way that is expected. Some of this starts from the hiring process. And this is very challenging for startup businesses or new businesses because you're desperate for employees. And so you go and hire the first person who comes across your desk, who's willing to take how much you want to pay them. And you're like, yeah, you're hired. Well, if that person is there just because it's a good paycheck and maybe they're skilled and can do what you want, but the personality doesn't necessarily adhere to the culture you're trying to set, then you're starting the cycle of, of maintaining these corrupt and bad cultures. So you could say, look, the hiring practice from the top down is we're going to be doing this and we're going to find like-minded people who fit within our company culture. And we're only going to hire those types of individuals well, now you're limiting. And when you become desperate because, oh, you know, Charlie just left and we've got to replace them. And, uh, oh, here's an application or I know somebody and they're really good. Let's bring them in. And you don't go through that vetting process. Well, then you're just introducing the elements that you're not looking for in your culture. So, yes, it still starts from the top down, but you have to be able to put in policies and procedures from hiring to onboarding to even termination that all fit and maintain that culture. And that tends to be a step that a lot of organizations forget about. Right, right. Uh, very well explained indeed. Um, so uh, just to uh, change things up uh, just a little bit, um, I am a career coach by profession. So I do coach uh, candidates when, you know, going for interviews and such. And um, over the years, I've had the pleasure of coaching a lot of people uh, go through Google interviews. Now, interviews at Google is obviously very different than majority of the other organizations. I will not uh, press you about Googliness. Uh, that's something which, uh, you know, there are articles out there which defines it. And there are many different things too, which go into it. But one of the curious things that I've come to know, and you again, you can correct me if I'm mistaken, is that at Google, hiring managers are not part of the recruiting process. Is this, uh, is this partially true or is this true? Yeah, it's absolutely true. And so, you know, you touched on a, the googliness that you're talking about is actually mm -hmm. what I just explained. That's all mm -hmm. part of finding individuals that fit the DNA or culture that we want to have right. Right. at Google. Yes. And so we've actually defined it and we mm -hmm. said, hey, uh, googliness mm -hmm. is defined in this way. And if you pass the googliness assessment, then we believe that you're a good fit into the culture of the organization. That goes hand in hand with other things like your background and your experience and your cognitive abilities and, uh, you know, your technical skills and aptitudes for things like it's an entire package. But the part you're talking about specifically in terms of of not having the hiring manager not a part of the interviewing process is ultimately to remove the bias from the interview process. And so if, if I'm hiring somebody 
in this scenario, if I'm hiring somebody and I say, oh, look, once again, here's Sarah's resume. Uh, that looks good. I'm going to hire this individual. Well, we haven't gone through all of these different interviews to ensure that they are the right fit. Aptitude and cognitive and Googliness and everything else. So what happens is you go through a series of interviews at Google. You get graded accordingly across all of the different types of interviews that I've mostly outlined. The hiring manager has nothing to do with it because the goal is, is that if a peer of Googlers, a peer of people who understand the values and the expectations and the job skills have approved, then we assure that the bias has been removed and they're meeting the basic foundations of what we're looking for at Google. So as opposed to a lot of other companies where it's just like, you make this person happy, you get the job, you've now got to make all of these people happy. And the hiring manager accepts that individual because they've been vetted through multiple people and multiple processes. And uh, we've removed, again, all of that bias in that uh, assessment. That's, uh, that's wonderful. A very unique uh, vetting process indeed. Um, <clears throat> One of the other things, um, because you one of your key areas is innovation, uh, it is my understanding that Google employees get to spend about 20% of their time working on their projects, which I you know leads to more innovation, um, different types of ideas and things like that. So what have you seen come out of this? Well, I can do my personal, you know, experience, which is, uh, yeah. So to backtrack just a little bit, we have this rule basically called an 80, 20 rule, 80% mm -hmm. of the time at work that I spend is on the job and role that I was hired to do 20% of my time can be done for any number of activities. And so we'll get to that. But if again, you've got people who are listening, an organization, you're out there hiring people and you're expecting them to work 110% in the role that I've hired you to do. And we understand that in most cases, people aren't spending 110% and they're probably really only spending 80%. And actually we found research that shows that people can really only dedicate 80% of their time fully to a single thing. At the same time, we want people to grow and learn and evolve and help the organization. So we're allocating 20% of your time to go do those things. And it could be, I just wanna learn a new skill. I could go work for a, a completely different group at, at Google and spend my 20% with them. For instance, I tell people often like, okay, you're coming into Google Cloud to be a part of sales, but maybe you're really interested in YouTube. Maybe there's a way to find a 20% role at YouTube. So you're kind of splitting your time and your manager all understand this. And we encourage it because again, it's about you growing individually and learning a new skill and helping the organization evolve. So for my 20% project, I actually started a podcast. I love podcasting. And I was like, hey, I think I see a, an opportunity here. There's a niche conversation. I want to start a podcast. We weren't doing podcasts within that realm. And so I spend 20% of my time producing content and podcasting and conversations like this to ultimately support the growth of Google. And so... In theory, Google is getting a free, awesome service all because they've allowed me to go do it. That's also part of the culture, this culture of innovation, culture of growth and learning. And it makes our employees happy because they're like, yeah, I, I don't get burnt out on this role that I've been hired to do. And I have this kind of escape where I can go and spend some time doing something I am passionate about and it bridges the gap and increases morale and 
generates opportunities and ultimately benefits Google in the long run. Excellent. That's a lot of great synergy happening. Um, you've added a lot of value today, Chris, for our audience. And I'm going to end with one last question. Um, there is a saying in business which says, fail fast, recover fast, um, or something to that nature, uh, because there are different uh, variations to that. But what I wanted to know from yourself is, what has been your success factor in your career? Or if you want to touch upon one of your biggest successes to date. Um, well, I, I mean, for me, success factors go all the way back to what we started the conversation with. Wake up every morning with a good peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> you know, contemplate life. <laughs> Be happy. Really, it just boils down to be happy. Whether you're building a culture mm -hmm. in your organization to ensure success of, of uh, your employees and to make sure they're happy, find roles that make you happy. I can't tell you anything beyond just find something that gets you up every morning and makes you excited to go do it. And, and whether that's a job or a hobby or anything else, like, you know, just be happy in that process and uh, learn to communicate with people, you know, learn to uh, have conversations that are going to inspire you and is, are going to help you learn a new skill or help you to just meet somebody else and hear their story and what they're going through. So, you know, for me, I, I think it's always been around that uh, uh, understanding of, of people and connections and conversations, and then also happiness. Find it, achieve it, and then that's where you're gonna be successful. You can be successful, and look, just to really quickly, success comes in a lot of different forms for a lot of different people. So you first have to ask yourself, what is success? And if that is, I want the job title and I wanna get paid a lot of money, great. Go try to do that. That's not what I think success is. I think success for me is if I continually to wake up and be motivated and, and inspired and to go do something incredible, that's success. It doesn't matter how much I get paid or what my job title is. So what is success for you? And then go and try to achieve that. Excellent. Uh, very much true. There is uh, no set parameter for success. You got to set it yourself and then you have to achieve it. Uh, excellent. Chris, thank you so much uh, for your time today. I really appreciate that. And uh, I wish you all the best and to making more PB&J sandwiches. Yes, absolutely. And success to you as well. Thank you. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate that. If you like what you saw, then give us a like. It helps with YouTube's algorithm. If you want to see similar kind of videos, then subscribe to the channel. And finally, there is a comment box where you can let us know if there is a type of professional or business owner you want featured on a future episode. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next one.